Okay, so in this lecture, we're going to introduce the concept of inertia. Inertia is the big thing that separates a static problem from a dynamic problem. And what we're going to do is ask ourselves the question, what happens when we don't apply the load to our cantilever beam here slowly? So what happens if we apply that load quickly? This is really going to show up the key differences between a static analysis and a dynamic analysis. So looking at a cantilever beam here, if we again plot the load versus time history for that structure, So we're saying that the load goes from a value of zero up to the same magnitude that we saw in the previous lecture up to a magnitude of P1, but now it happens over a time T2. And the key thing here is that T2 is a lot less than T1, where T1 was the time it took to rise to a value of P1 in the last lecture when we were saying it was being applied slowly. So now it's being applied rapidly. And the interesting thing now is to think about what does the response look like? So let's draw the, the response for the structure versus time. We're still going to mark on this value delta 1, which was, let's, the, let's say, the static deflection that we saw previously. So remember, previously we saw the response or deflection mirror the load, and it rose up to a value of T1 and stayed constant. But now, when we apply that load rapidly or quickly, we get a totally different behavior. Okay, so if you've studied structural dynamics of any kind in the past, you'll recognize this. This is a sinusoidal, or in this case, more specifically, it's an exponentially decaying sinusoidal oscillation. So we'll, we'll pick out the various different parts of this. The first thing we can say is that the response or deflection of the structure goes way past delta 1, way past the static deflection, up to some peak value. So we can mark off some peak value here. So we're going to call this the peak dynamic response. And we can see very clearly that it's greater than the static response. Now, the other thing that we could say is that we have this exponential decay in magnitude or amplitude of this oscillation. So the oscillation amplitude is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and the rate of decay is exponential. So we could describe that rate of decay, and indeed we will, as we move on in the course, we will describe that using an exponential function. So we can call that, let's see, we've got a time where we get our peak dynamic response and we have a window of time that extends to where the response essentially decays back down to converge on the static response delta 1. So let's just mark off an arbitrary point here where the response has decayed away and we can note that we have a peak response followed by a decaying oscillation. Okay, and the last thing that we want to note on here is the level of static deflection. And we'll notice that the deflection or the response of our structure, the dynamic response, it's converging, it's oscillating around the level of the static response. And it's converging onto that level of static response delta 1. Okay, so we've got a lot of things happening here. This is a classic example of a dynamic response, and it has arisen from the same load magnitude. It's just that that load magnitude was applied, it went from zero to its maximum value, P1, in a, in a much shorter time frame. And in doing so, it induced this dynamic response, which was characterized by a peak dynamic response, which was greater than the static response, and then an oscillation, a sinusoidal oscillation. So an oscillation that could be described by a sine function, and the amplitude of that oscillation was decaying exponentially. Now, the key question for us to consider, why is it simply that the change in the rate at which we apply the load induces such a different dynamic behavior? And the key reason it does is due to the influence of what we call inertia. Inertia is really the key thing that differentiates a static problem from a dynamic problem. Or to put that another way, it's the influence of inertia, which is the key thing that we have to model in a dynamic problem. So we can't really progress any further until we do a bit of a detour into inertia, until we pin down exactly what we mean when we say inertia. So before we do that, we'll make a quick note at the end of this, just to label this up as a dynamic response and flag up the fact that it's caused due to the influence of inertia. So we'll say this is a dynamic response caused by the influence of inertia. So now the next obvious question is, what is inertia? So we'll do a little aside here. 
Inertia is a body's or a mass's resistance to a change in its own velocity. Fundamentally, that's all it is, captured in a single sentence. All right, that's the first thing to nail down. And the next point is that we model this resistance with an inertia force. Okay, so there's two big ideas to get your head around there. Any mass is going to resist a change in its own velocity. And we model this resistance with an inertia force. So let's just get that down. Okay, so let's break out a free body diagram here and we can try and understand this a little bit better. So we're going to start off by thinking about a ball, simple ball, that has a mass m. It's resting on a flat piece of ground. Let's define a coordinate u. Okay, so that's how we're going to measure displacement of this mass with reference to this coordinate axis. Let's just call u or label it the displacement. Okay, this mass experiences some force f, uh, a function of t, let's say. Now, before we go any further, let me just, let's just say that we're ignoring air resistance and we're ignoring friction. Okay, so the only forces acting on this mass are going to be the forces that I draw onto this free body diagram. Now, if I apply a force, ft, right, it's going to cause that ball to move, right? So m is going to undergo some acceleration, which is just the rate of change of velocity. So let's make a couple of notes here as we go along. So m will undergo an acceleration, which we know is just a rate of change of velocity. The second important point to state is that that mass, that ball, wants to resist any change in its velocity, right? This is the, this is the inertia that the ball, because it is a mass, it, it possesses inertia. And because of that inertia, it wants to resist a change in its own velocity. Now, we're working with a free body diagram here, so we need to represent that resistance in some way. And we do that with the inertia force. So we say there is an inertia force experienced by the ball that resists the change in velocity. So we say F subscript capital I for inertia. And that inertia force is equal to the mass of the ball times the acceleration of the ball, where we're going to represent acceleration as u with the two dots over to represent the second differential of the displacement u. So the inertia force F subscript i is equal to m times u dot dot, okay, for the second differential. Second differential of displacement with respect to time we know is the acceleration. Fundamentally, that's, that's all there is to it. So what we're saying here is that the ball, if it experiences this force f function of t, it's going to experience a change in its velocity, which is an acceleration. It wants to resist any change in its velocity. And so we represent that resistance by an inertia force, which is equal to the mass times the acceleration. So now the other thing that we can say is that once the ball is moving, all right, if it, once the ball is moving along, if I remove ft, right, so if I remove the external force ft, the ball wants to keep moving with a constant velocity, and we know this from Newton's first law. So Newton's first law, for anyone who, who doesn't remember, states that a body remains at rest or moving with a constant velocity in a given direction unless an unbalanced force acts on it, right? So if I take away my external force, F of t, now bearing in mind I'm at a constant velocity, I'm moving at a constant velocity, that ball will keep moving at a constant velocity because there are no external forces acting on it. Remember, the inertia force has disappeared because the velocity is constant, there is no acceleration. And if I remove my external force Ft, there's no external forces acting on the ball, and so it will just continue moving at a constant velocity. Remember, we're ignoring uh, real world conditions like air resistance and friction and those kinds of things. That state is called a state of dynamic equilibrium. The ball is moving, there are no external forces acting on it. We're more familiar and probably comfortable with the concept of static equilibrium, where the thing is not moving and all forces acting on it are balanced. But if the thing is moving and there are, there's a, full, a complete balance of forces acting on it, or indeed no forces acting on it, that's called dynamic equilibrium. So we can capture that in a quick note as well. So this, this idea of dynamic equilibrium, this is why if you've ever found yourself standing behind a car, you know, you've got to push a car because maybe it's um, maybe it won't start and you need to push it to get it started. You'll find that it's really hard to get the car moving if you're trying to push a car. It's really hard to get it going. But once you get it going, OK, it's much, much easier to keep it moving. This is all because to get it going, you've got to overcome that initial inertia. Another really, really key point here to understand 
is that the inertia force, this guy here, this guy here, this inertia force, that is what we would call a fictitious force. So it's not an externally applied force like this guy is, but it's a fictitious force. It models the behavior of the mass. Okay, so that's one important thing to uh, to keep in mind. F, a function of t, is an externally applied force. I'm actually coming along and I'm applying F of t. But F i, the inertia force, that just exists by virtue of the fact that we have a mass and that mass is experiencing an acceleration. So it's a fictitious force that represents or that models that body's resistance to a change in its velocity. So it's just an important point. It's a subtle point, but it's an important one to be aware of. So we'll make a, a quick note of that as well. So let's summarize. All masses resist changes in their velocity. So a mass wants to maintain either a static or dynamic equilibrium, right? So it wants to resist the change in its velocity. We model this physical behavior in our free body diagrams and equations by applying a fictitious inertia force, okay? So we this, this inherent behavior that masses have or exhibit, we need to be able to model it somehow, right? Because ultimately as engineers, we work with free body diagrams and we work with equations. And we need this thing to appear in our equations and we make it appear in our equations by using this fictitious force, which is called the inertia force, right? Which is a mass multiplied by the acceleration of that mass. So we can, we can note down a couple of these points. One, all masses resist change in their velocity. We said another way to say that was that mass wants to maintain a static or dynamic equilibrium. This was Newton's first law, essentially. Our second point was that we model this physical behavior uh, in our free body diagrams and equations with this fictitious inertia force. And the final point we'd say is that the inertia force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. And if we were to capture that in an equation, we've seen it already, fi is equal to m times u dot dot. Right, so we've done our, we'll close that off there. That was our, the end of our aside. So we've done a bit of a deep dive into what inertia is. Well, not so much a deep dive as, a, as much as a summary, really, of the key points around inertia. Now what we're going to do in the next lecture is take what we now know about inertia and we're going to apply it back to our beam problem and see how it explains the behavior, the dynamic behavior of our beam.